Okay, so first I'd like to uh, thank the uh, organizers for the uh, invitation and uh, the Institute and uh, some of the organizers for uh, their uh, generosity. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, so I'll explain what hypocoercivity is, but I will also explain what uh, piecewise deterministic Markov processes are. But um, basically, I'll spend quite a, a bit of time not talking about these two things. I'll, I'll spend quite a bit of time talking about Markov chains. And uh, the reason is that probably most of you are uh, more familiar with Markov chains than Markov um, processes. And basically, they are um, sufficiently uh, close to the Markov processes I'm interested in that um, the transition will be uh, smooth. This is joint work with um, all these people, I provide you with more information about this later on. So the motivation, well, nothing new really, I'm just uh, setting up the notation. So we are interested in something from a probability distribution um, pi. There are many reasons why we may be interested in, in this. So for example, computing expectations. And uh, I'm going to focus first on Markov chain Monte Carlo um, methods, if you're not familiar with uh, these methods, the idea is that um, you're going to try to sample simulation um, realizations of a Markov chain which have some um, properties, right? So I is the, uh, in, uh, the iteration you're considering your Markov chain um, at. And really the, the two basic properties we are typically interested in are the following. So first we're interested in the uh, sequence of probabilities of um, this uh, Markov chain to converge to the probability of interest, right? And we may be interested in um, basically considering this type of uh, averages and asking whether in some sense we've got uh, convergence to uh, this deterministic quantity that is the expectation of F with respect to, um, to pi. And there are many ways one can design Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, but also Markov process um, based uh, Monte Carlo methods. And um, the issue is very often that of choosing the, the Markov chain. So I won't give answer to any answer to uh, this problem, but that's the general uh, framework of um, the context of the things I'm going to uh, talk about. That is, in some cases, understanding the theoretical pro properties of uh, um, these processes may be helpful either to design the, um, the algorithm. So an example is, for example, for finite n, you know, what is the variability of the estimator on the left-hand side? So that could be um, a question, and you may have to choose between various algorithms. And of course, the algorithm you uh, would want to choose is the algorithm you can implement, and the algorithm um, that, is also, that also has the smallest variance. So I won't talk about this issue at all this time, so probably next week I will talk about uh, this in, uh, in the context of non-reversible uh, Markov chains and Markov uh, processes. In fact, in this talk, I'm really going to, con um, to focus on this question, right? So um, very briefly, most Markov chain Monte Carlo methods uh, that we've been using so far are not necessarily uh, reversible, but they rely on um, blocks, building blocks that are reversible. And some of the algorithms are completely uh, reversible. And for various reasons, reversibility has played a very important role um, in Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo uh, methods. At a theoretical level, there are numeric, um, numerous theoretical uh, results. So that's somehow the, a uh, probabilist or uh, functional analyst paradise uh, to work on um, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods when they are reversible. But it turns out that in practice, reversibility is not necessarily a desirable property. And I'll um, um, show you some uh, toy examples that illustrate why this may not be a, a good idea. And recently, there's been a renewed interest in uh, designing algorithms which rely on non-reversible Markov chains or not non-reversible Markov processes. Okay, but far less is understood about uh, these processes. Uh, 
So the presentation is mainly about uh, reviewing existing re results for some non-reversible Markov chains, and in fact, Markov chains on discrete spaces, um, really, and some novel results on uh, their continuous counterparts. Okay, so here, everything can be continuous in, um, in this scenario. Okay, so I'll start with basically so the discrete time set setup that is Markov chains. So just in case you had never heard of the metropolis hasting algorithm, so we are interested in sampling from a distribution pi defined on some probability space. And in order to uh, design a metropolis hasting uh, update, the first thing you need is you need to choose a family of um, probability distribution that I will refer to as the proposal uh, distribution. So for any x, you define a probability uh, distribution, and then the metropolis hasting uh, probability transition, which I will denote in this way, um, proceeds as follows algorithmically. So given that you're at x in the state space, you're going to propose a possible transition to z according to qx, right? You're going to compute this uh, acceptance uh, probability. So this is less than one, and you've got to compute this uh, ratio in here. And then with probability alpha, which is given by this, basically you're going to decide that your y, where you're going to, is a z, the proposed samples. Otherwise, you're going to uh, reject and stay where you were. Right? So... <clears throat> What one can um, easily establish in this scenario is that we've got this property, okay? So that's the detailed balance. And uh, basically what you're saying is that at equilibrium, the probability of being at X and going to Y is the same as the probability of being uh, at Y and going back to, to X, right? So this automatically ensures that uh, pi is left um, invariant. And it also implies that basically if you consider the process at equilibrium, then if you revert uh, time, basically the process is the same uh, distribution, right? So hence the reversibility terminology. So now I'm going to move on uh, slowly towards uh, a type of non-reversible uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo um, method. And I'm going to do it with uh, really uh, a toy example um, which is easy to generalize, okay, but captures really what is important about uh, most known non-reversible uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, right? So here we're going to say that the space on which our probability distribution lives is Z, the set of uh, integers, and uh, this is what the random walk metropolis algorithm is going to look like in this scenario. So now that we are uh, assume that you're at X, what you're going to do is that you're going to propose either to go to the left or to the right with a probability a half a half, okay? So that's what we are saying here. You compute the acceptance ratio, which in this case uh, takes this very simple um, form, and you accept or reject um, the move to x plus v with this uh, probability, right? So that's still uh, reversible and still satisfies this um, identity. And the thing that is not um, nice about this, so apart from the fact that basically the set of, if you like, the set of uh, reversible Markov chain is probably smaller than the set of Markov chains, right? It's a subset. So basically you, you've got less degrees of freedom. Another thing which was the motivation actually for early work in um, non-reversible Markov chain is this, that is basically at equilibrium, Right. If you go to Y, well, if you've gone to Y, it was, prob it was probable, right? But you've got this identity, so it's also probable that you will go back, right? So that's not a nice behavior because you've already visited um, X in this scenario. Okay. So um, just something that uh, I'm going to exploit in the next slide, but it was a space constraint. So very often, if you're not familiar with this idea, a strategy to sample from pi which may be very helpful, consists of sampling from another convenient distribution mu, right? Which is such that when you sample from mu, you can recover sample from pi. 
So the simplest example, and that's the, uh, what I'm going to exploit here, is the scenario where pi is a marginal of mu, okay? because you just ignore the components that are of no interest, and if you sample from mu, you're sampling from, from pi. So I'm going to exploit this. Okay, and I'm going to introduce um, something that looks like the random walk um, metropolis, but it's slightly different, right? And it addresses the backtracking problem. So the metro the, this algorithm works even if X is RD or can be, uh, you know, you can consider more general scenarios, okay? But this is sufficient to illustrate the main idea, okay? So here, as announced in the, on the previous slide, basically we are going to sample from this distribution, right? And we all agree that pi of x is um, the marginal distribution in x of mu, right? So if I sample from this, I get samples from pi. And we introduce the auxiliary variable v, which can take um, two values, minus and one and one. And of course, it looks like the increment. Okay, it is not by chance that I've chose the, the name V in the previous slide for the, for the increment. So the space on which we are going to sample is uh, the product, and now we are going to consider a Markov chain on the product space. So hence the modified um, notation. And the algorithm is going to proceed as follows. So given X and V, the velocity, what you are going to do is Basically, you don't do much. You just compute the acceptance ratio, okay, for the metropolis algorithm. So you see here, I'm not sampling V. If I give you XV, you just use what the current state of the Markov chain. This is completely deterministic, if you like, if I give you XV. And depending on um, basically this probability now, you're going to either um, say that you're moving to x plus v, v, right? So that's the new state of your Markov chain. So you're moving forward in the position space, but you're not changing the velocity, right? So somehow the direction in which you, you're, you're going. And if you reject, well, you stay at x, but you see you negate the velocity, right? So you're going to bounce back. So in other words, what is important, well, there are two things that are important, is that this looks very much like the uh, random walk metropolis algorithm, but here it has the particularity that instead of um, having the detailed balance, which is broken in, in this scenario, basically the process is going to travel in the same direction, in a straight line, um, as long as there's no rejection occurs, right? And then you're moving back in the uh, opposite direction. So that's really the, uh, the difference. So in this scenario, because I had a question about this yesterday, so you, in this scenario, you don't satisfy the detailed balance, but you satisfy what is referred to as the skewed detailed balance sometimes in the literature, okay? Um, in order to get uh, detailed balance, you would need these um, two minuses uh, not to be there, right? So you're not reversible, but you're not far from something that looks like reversibility. Okay, so I'll talk more about this property uh, next week, I think. Okay, so just the two algorithms in, in parallel, just to show you uh, that they are very similar, but their behavior can be quite significantly different. So one thing that can be shown is that the deterministic behavior that you're introducing in the uh, guided uh, random walk so most often, you would have to be a bit more precise about this, okay, but that's really the, uh, the take-home home message, is that introducing this kind of behavior is a good thing if the asymptotic variance, okay, of expectations along um, the path of your Markov chain is what you're interested in. Um, this is always a good thing, okay? Um, maybe I'll comment on that next week. But I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about convergence to equilibrium today, right? Uh, a warning, okay. Uh, all this is just uh, non-quantitative and it's not obvious that the gains are significant, okay, in terms of asymptotic variance. I think it really depends on the, on the scenario, so no silver bullet here. Okay, convergence to equilibrium. So that was, I think, the, the, the primary motivation for uh, 
interest in particular in the statistical uh, literature or probability literature for this type of um, algorithms, okay? And in particular, in this paper, uh, Diakonis, Holmes, and Neil um, studied a slight modification of Gustafsson's algorithm in a very, very uh, simple scenario, right, which was easy enough that you could uh, come up with uh, uh, precise estimates of the rate of convergence, basically. Okay, so we are simplifying our problem further. So we are going from Z to basically the first D uh, non-negative, uh, non-zero integers, okay, and positive integers. And we are going to consider the, we are going to assume that pi is the uniform distribution. Okay, so it's getting really much simpler. And this is what the uh, algorithm they, they uh, studied is, is, uh, looks like. Okay, so the first bit is basically um, Gustafsson's algorithm. Okay, it's just that because, um, and they knew that, okay, but it may uh, not be obvious when you, you read the paper the first time. So in this scenario, because you're considering the uniform distribution constraint to this uh, set, basically the acceptance ratio can only take um, two values, zero or one, right? And this is again the, um, similar to the Gustafsson, al Gustafsson's algorithm, but they add another thing, right? So what they add is that with some probability theta, basically you're going to um, uh, give yourself the possibility of uh, basically changing the sign again, right? Okay, so Gustafsson's algorithm corresponds to the scenario where theta is equal to zero, right? So for theta equals to zero, you get Gustafsson's guided walk, okay? But this algorithm doesn't converge, right? Because this is a deterministic algorithm. You only get once, so if you propose, you always move to the right until basically you hit uh, D, right? And then you go back, right? So you never converge in terms of um, marginal distribution. Of course, in terms of averaging, that's super good, right? And that's not unrelated to what I, the, the results I was referring to earlier, okay? So basically, um, by introducing uh, theta not equal to zero, basically they managed to um, make the chain um, uh, irreducible, right? So that's just a copy of the previous slide. And the, one may ask various questions. So does this converge faster than the reversible counterpart, okay, than the random walk metropolis, which in this case will turn out to be just a, a standard random walk, right? And what is the complexity required for the, of the algorithm to achieve a set precision epsilon, okay? So you, I'm asking you to produce samples whose distribution is within epsilon of pi, Right? How many iterations are, are needed? And how, what is the dependence of this number of iterations as the dimension of the problem increases? Okay, so we expect that this is going to be more difficult and require more iterations when D increases. That's the, the idea. Right, so that's directly taken from, the, from their paper where they use different notation. Okay, so their N is what I call uh, D and they chose theta to be equal to one over D in their scenario, so one over N, hence all those one over Ns, okay. And uh, what may uh, be a bit confusing here is that I was considering a parameterization in terms of X and the velocity, but what they decided to do, to do is to say, well, actually, um, one corresponds to uh, x equals one and the velocity equals one, whereas minus one corresponds to one and the velocity equal to minus one. So it's just a different parameterization, which is nice when you handle matrices. That was their, uh, their motivation. So if we start with D states, right, of course we need, um, you know, with the, um, this type of uh, algorithm, basically you've got twice as many states as uh, you're actually interested in, okay? We are interested in one to n, but because of the velocities, you've got twice as many um, states. So this is why the graph looks like 
uh, looks like this. Okay, and this is to be contrasted with the standard random walk metropolis where with probability a half a half you go to the left or to the right. Okay, and that corresponds exactly to the random walk metropolis that I described earlier. So here's some, uh, some pictures to show you that really you, you get a very different uh, behavior, right? So we are targeting the uniform distribution, so that's the straight line here. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to show you the uh, probability distribution of the Markov chain after n iterations. So this is iteration one. So we are starting the, the Markov chain um, at one. And um, so, of course, the, um, the other Markov chain lives on a bigger space, right, which is represented here. And that's quite nice to reparameterize things the way they did. Okay, you can see uh, why it's... It's nice, okay, but what I've did, I did is that I marginalized all the distributions that you obtain here, okay, to just focus on X, right, what I call X, in order to allow for comparison with the, the behavior of the, um, of the random walk metropolis, okay. So, is that clear? So the iteration number is here, and basically we are starting with a velocity of plus one, so we expect things to move towards the, the right, okay? And this is what happens, so iteration six, uh, 11, and you see here, basically the central limit theorem is kicking in, okay? But you see, because you, you're backtracking, there's a central limit theorem, but you're not exploring the space very quickly, whereas here, the chain is very efficient, okay? doing this, right? And you see that very rapidly on the left-hand side, you're close to the distribution of interest, whereas on the left-hand side, you're, you're struggling. Okay. So the question they, they addressed is, what is the, the complexity? So what they've managed to, to prove is that um, basically you can get this sort of uh, geometric convergence for the algorithm that I... Uh, just mentioned for some um, distance. And the question is, how do C and rho scale with D, right? So why is that? Um, I'll show you why it is interesting. Because it might be that rho goes to 1 as D um, goes to infinity, and that C explodes as D goes to infinity. Okay, so that's not the, the case. What they managed to do is to show for that for a, a good choice of Theta d, you remember, that's the afterthought probability, okay? You decide to change the sign um, again in order to make the chain irreducible. What they show is that in total variation distance, which is just a distance between vectors in this case, basically the constant c is equal to 1, and then you converge geometrically at this rate. And what is important is that basically you can um, somehow separate the uh, dependence on the dimension in the, the convergence rate. So in particular, what you can say is how many iterations do I need for um, basically this to be equal to epsilon, right? And the answer is, is here. And what is important here is uh, that basically you depend linearly on the dimension, right? So basically the, your cost, the number of iteration is only going to grow um, linearly to reach this precision, right? And this is to be, this should be contrasted with a random walk metropolis, okay, for which basically the complexity is going to be in D square, right? So there's a gain. And of course, we've observed that numerically um, earlier. We converge much, much faster. So that's a possible interest of uh, uh, non-reversible chain. I think it's not the only uh, interesting property about the, the smart Markov chains, but that was the, um, one of the, the things that they noticed. And that was the first message in their paper, but there was also a negative message in their paper because they considered this distribution. So the V-shaped distribution, right? So there's a valley, that's the, the, the problem in this case. And the question is, do we observe the same gain? So using results that Diakonis had uh, established earlier, one can show that you need that many steps in order to um, basically reach a precision of epsilon. You know, there are additional terms, but that's the, uh, 
how the complexity in the dimension grows. Okay, but someone else showed that um, basically, if you consider the, um, the, the, the Gustafsson's al algorithm, basically with, that, with the theta uh, in the background, basically you get uh, a complexity in d square. So the gain is not that great. Okay, so that was the, uh, the negative um, message of their paper. And I think it's probably one of the reasons why they lost interest in those uh, algorithms at the time. That's my theory, okay. Um, however, so there's a paper, and I haven't checked the proof, but uh, I bet it's, it's all correct, who says that basically if your distribution is log-concave, then you, you, you still get a complexity that is linear in D, right? So basically it looks like these algorithms are not very good at crossing um, valleys, okay? But if you can go as far as you can and that this is a, an interesting to do. It seems that this is the, the right thing to do. So I won't dwell on this too much because I'd like to talk about other things. I'm going to move on to uh, basically the continuous time version of all this. And unfortunately, we don't have uh, as clear uh, conclusions as um, Diakonis and his collaborators in, uh, in, in those papers, but there are some things that look similar, at least at a superficial level. So first, I will start talking about so PDMP, piecewise deterministic Markov processes. So now we are moving from the discrete time setup to the continuous time um, setup. And uh, informally, so what are PDMP? So again, we are going to try to sample from, um, so it's very similar to the Gustafsson algorithm and they, they're actually close connections um, between the, the, this, um, the continuous time and the discrete time um, algorithms. So we are again going to sample from a, um, an extended distribution with pi as a marginal. And here we've got a velocity which is not necessarily discrete um, valued. It's distributed some new which should satisfy some properties that I will uh, refer to later on. And these processes, they've got the, the following properties. So first, there's something deterministic about them. So that is XTVT is going to follow a deterministic, uh, so this, this A shouldn't be here, is going to follow deterministic trajectories for random times, for random time intervals, okay? So between some TK minus one and TK, which will be random, you're going to follow a deterministic uh, trajectory, right? And I will refer to these times as even times. So there are some events that are uh, triggered somehow. And uh, at some random times, something is going to happen. So basically, the deterministic trajectories are going to, uh, to stop. You're going to say that xt is the limit of what your deterministic trajectory um, is, okay, when you go to tk and the velocity is updated, right? And there are many degrees of freedom here about how you can do about this, and I try to sh um, provide you with an overview, a synthetic overview of um, how this works that covers many of the uh, algorithms, and the message will be that basically our results hold for all that class of algorithms, okay? So we cover many cases at once. So this is a high level review of uh, how this works. So I'm going to introduce additional notations. So uh, minus log of pi is going to be up to a constant uh, denoted u of x, right? And I'll do the same thing for the other uh, distribution. So by the way, I didn't talk about densities and whatever, but in both scenarios, I, um, I'm dealing with the, the densities. So here it's typically, typically the Lebesgue measure, and here it, it depends, okay? So there are various scenarios uh, here, but really that's not the, the issue that's very easy to uh, handle. Okay, so um, the deterministic trajectories are uh, defined as solutions of uh, an ODE, that's the standard um, scenario, and in fact for Actually, I think all the PDMPs I know of, um, basically they can be thought of as being the um, 
the solutions to um, Hamilton's equation for some uh, potential, right? So it doesn't have to be the potential uh, you're actually interested in, right? So, uh, for example, if you, uh, so let's go through some examples and I'll show you some pictures at some point. So you can decide that basically your deterministic trajectory is going to follow the contours of the ISO contours of the distribution you're interested in. Okay, that's the uh, simplest scenario. Another thing you can do is that basically you can um, say that your potential is zero. So somehow you think about a uniform um, measure KV is more or less arbitrary. And basically what happens in this case is that you follow straight lines in the position space and V remains constant, right? So that's purely deterministic. And basically any compatible combination of these two things can be used, right? So there's, there are many possibilities here and I won't go uh, through them. That wouldn't be too interesting. What about the events? So um, that are going to determine the, basically the probability distributions of the, the, the T, the, the uh, intervals I was um, talking about. Basically, they follow a non-homogeneous Poisson process with some intensity lambda xv. I'll get back to uh, how you should choose this thing later on. And basically, this is going to be the distribution of your uh, Ti conditional on the past. Okay, so it's of this form, and I call this a non-homogeneous Poisson process. Right. So what about the update for the, the velocities where there are many ways you can um, do that again, but again, we are going to focus on something that doesn't cover all the possibilities, but covers many uh, known possibilities in, uh, in a one framework. So what we are going to assume is that uh, basically the updates are going to be a mixture of, uh, on the one hand, deterministic updates of this type, right? So you need to define some end case, so you need vectors, and I'll show you some examples in a, in a few slides. And basically, so the updates here, they just correspond to reflections through hyperplanes that are orthogonal to the end case. So that's going to be, um, the general theme, and there's another update. Basically, you, you, you may be, if you can sample from new, the distribution of the velocity at equilibrium, okay. Um, another possible update is going to be uh, this one. So you just refresh the, um, the velocity from the, the, the distribution of interest. I will denote pi the corresponding operator uh, we can also treat the scenario where the update is a uh, shine Lulimbeck uh, uh, process and everything, but I, I'm not covering this in this talk uh, at all. I'm far less interested in, in this, but some people are. Okay, and the way you're going to um, choose your updates is uh, according to a probability on the update uh, number. Okay, so the number here corresponds to the K here and the scenario where k equals to where m equals to zero corresponds to two. Basically, you you refresh, and basically this is parameterized in this way. And of course, um, you can think of this as being intensities of a, a Poisson process. Okay. Right. So I'll let you. I'll, I'll tell you more about the choice of n k's in a few slides. Okay, so just to summarize, this is what a PDMP is going to look like. You initialize, um, you assume that you've reached time Ti uh, minus one, you draw uh, Ti, okay, from um, this distribution, and I assume that we can do this here. So we are in the scenario where the uh, auxiliary potential is zero, so we follow a straight line, right, up to time um, Ti, if you like. So that's how we define XTI. Then we draw, according to some probability, um, basically the way we are going to update uh, the velocity. So either we refresh or we use a deterministic um, update of this form, which is a reflection through a plane, right? And for those of you who know about this algorithm, this covers uh, the zigzag, the 
Bansi particle samplers and variations around uh, this theme. Okay? And the reason I'm doing that is because when you state the theorem, you cover all these things at once. Okay? You don't have to distinguish between the, the various scenarios up to some subtleties. So some choice uh, of hyperplanes. So, um, so I, I will refer to PT, to the probability of the, the process at time t, given that we started at x naught v naught. I will refer to this in using this notation. So that's uh, fairly um, standard. Um, so one choice of n. So basically here you don't have to make any choice. So that's the scenario where um, we are going to follow the deterministic trajectory is going to follow the contour of the distribution you're targeting, basically, right? So that's what I'm uh, saying um, here. And this is a scenario basically where you don't need to define your vector ends, okay? Because basically there's no need for any uh, reflection. The only thing that you're going to do is that you're going to uh, resample your velocities afresh. Okay, from time to time, at random times. And one possible choice is, well, is to uh, uh, say that you're, you're going to, to do this with a constant um, rate, right? So here is, uh, so you understand why I didn't do art. So <laughs> this is, uh, these are the, the contours of the joint distribution mu, right? So here you've got the x's, here are the v's. And uh, basically what happens, you're at xti minus 1, vti minus 1 here. You follow the contour for some random time, right? You can define xti here, but you cannot define uh, vti. And then what you're going to do is that you're going to resample uh, v, okay? So x remains constant, and then you change contour. And from here, basically, you're going to uh, keep moving. Right? That's it. So another example, which is uh, less obvious, so is the one-dimensional zigzag. So here the x is the real line, and v can take two values, minus one, one. Right? Um, we are going to consider this scenario. So we follow straight lines. v remains constant um, when the deterministic behavior kicks in. And here, basically, the K is, capital K is equal to 1, so we just define one normal, if you like, and basically it's going to be um, basically the sign of the, of the derivative, right? Okay, so one can specify, specify an intensity that makes it all work. In particular, you leave the distribution um, invariant, and this is what this looks like, right? So basically, that's your target distribution pi this time. It's not mu. And um, basically, nx, you see, points to the right when you increase and points to the left when you, um, when you decrease. And so I, I thought a bit about this. I, I realized writing the talk that a hyperplane for a line is a point. Okay, I had never realized that. And basically, what, what it says is that, uh, basically, let, let's assume you're traveling to to the right, for example, okay, a reflection around a point where you just negate, right? Whatever you're, you're doing. So that's the, exactly this scenario. So you can consider the plane version of the particle bouncy sampler. So that's more uh, straightforward. So again, we follow uh, straight lines. And here, basically, the um, k is equal to 1 again, and the normal is basically the, the, the direction of the, of the gradient. Okay, you can define a proper intensity in this scenario, and this is where, what it looks like. So these are the contours of pi, right? And um, so this is xti. Um, this is your uh, velocity before you've reached uh, time ti, so that was v ti minus 1, remember it was uh, constant, your normal is in that direction, okay, the hyperplane, which is a line here, is here, so basically you just uh, reflect, right? So now the multidimensional 
zigzag process. So here we are in RD. V can take these uh, values. And here the normals are of this form. So basically you just look in each direction. You look at the, the gradient and you look at the, basically the sign of your gradient in uh, all directions. And here, uh, your, so you need the sign and then you uh, multiply by EK where EK is the canonical basis. Right, so what I mean by canonical basis, so here we've got the contours of pi. This is the direction x1, direction x2. These are the two canonical vectors, so they are unique um, vectors. And here things are a bit more uh, complicated. So this is xti minus one. This is, uh, so where is, uh, vti minus one is here, right? And of course there, are, so here I've assumed that the, the sign of the gradient was positive in this uh, region. So N1 points here and N2 points here. And depending on which of the two red vectors you're choosing, basically you obtain a VTI minus one, which is a reflection either around basically this hyperplane, if you choose N2, or the other way around. Okay? So just here, um, a message to say that everything fits in this, in this, um, in this framework. Right? As long as you're like this, basically it's going to, to work. One thing to notice here, actually, which is uh, sort of interesting, is if you look at the gradient of ux, basically it's the sum of uh, the gradient of u0, which was equal to, to zero. So that's uh, not so surprising, but this is more interesting because here what we are saying is that we've decomposed somehow the gradient of u into, um, into these terms and that these terms determine the algorithm, if you see what I mean, okay? And in fact, it was not uh, perhaps straightforward, but all the algorithms I have talked about follow this pattern, okay? And this is what you need, basically, for the algorithm. So you decompose the, the gradient of um, the algorithm, okay? And basically, our results, we rely on this condition. So we s assume that we can we've got a decomposition of the gradient of u in some way, and that determines the algorithm automatically, right? Or at least the class of algorithms for which the, uh, the, 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 the updates on v consists either of a refreshment or um, a reflection okay. around basically this um, nk, right? So that will explain uh, things a bit, okay? And of course, um, this has been, this property has been exploited, but not uh, in the way we, we've shown, in um, other scenarios. So for example, uh, there are scenarios where u of x is of this form. So of course the gradient is uh, basically the sum of the gradient of the uis. And it might be that in some scenarios you can define algorithms that are computationally um, efficient. And in this case, your uh, nk is defined in this way, right? Okay, and of course an observation that has been made in the, in the past is that basically it may be that you cannot follow, you cannot solve Hamilton's equation for the distribution of interest, but for some uh, auxiliary distribution, you can, uh, you can do it. And in this case, kappa k is equal to one and f1 should be taken of this form. And you see that the sum um, basically of your f1 and uh, the gradient of u0 is u. Right, so this had been noticed in the in, in the past, but the connection with the the, the um, with the zigzag was not. Of course, it was there in the background, but it was not uh, as explicit. And by the way, what this suggests is that basically you can choose um, n case, you know, any basis, something that is a basis in your in your space, and you project your gradient on that basis. You've got that property automatically, and you've defined an algorithm. Okay. I don't know if it's useful, but it's uh, sort of interesting, right? And there are infinitely many combinations. But what is important is that it's going to explain one of our conditions, right, in our, in our theorem, which is going to be of this form, okay? And there will be that connection between these FKs and the way we update V. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, get closer to um, the results. I've got five minutes. So um, I'm going to think of PT as an operator that's 
Classico, and I'm going to uh, denote by PTF, or any uh, F for which this makes sense, uh, the integral of uh, F with respect to uh, the transition uh, probability, and I will consider the square integrable uh, functions, right, and the square integrable functions whose expectation is equal to zero, right? One thing that is maybe important if I talk about the, I've got time to talk about the bonus uh, later on. Uh, we can introduce this in a product, okay, which is just for two functions, the product, the integral of the product of the two functions integrated with respect to the distribution um, of interest. So Z consists of X and, and V in our uh, scenario. And more importantly, in the short term, uh, I'm going to consider this norm. Right, which is associated to this uh, inner product. And um, what is hypocoercivity? Um, so that I have said, but basically we are interested in the existence of, uh, so it should be an alpha, it should be an alpha here, okay. Um, we are interested, imagine this is an alpha, this is a C, so this is the alpha and the C, such that for uh, any probability measure, which is the initial distribution of the Markov chain, which is dominated by mu, you've got this kind of uh, inequality, so convergence to equilibrium that is uh, exponential, and it turns out that this is, this is equivalent to uh, using the norm that I defined on the previous uh, slide, okay? So basically what we do in the paper is that we focus on, on this and we deduce uh, this automatically. So surprisingly for the type of process we are talking about and not just PDMPs, okay, the PDMPs, they've got uh, other cousins that were of interest to um, uh, these people as well. They, 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 um, they have not been that many results until, until relatively um, recently. So don't worry, uh, the, the, the people who understand can tell you what the joke is um, uh, tonight at the pub. So, so now what I'm going to talk about is really work with um, these people, okay? So we need some assumptions, and um, really I'm going to focus on the main assumption. There are various technical assumptions that are there so that you can do the calculations, but they are not really harmful. So I'm focusing on really what seems to be really important. So of course, you've got to characterize your probability distribution. So C2 is to allow you to do calculations. We need this um, property. So basically the Hessian of the, the energy is uh, basically not too negative, right? So that's not too harmful. One can relax the uh, the assumption, but it leads to more complex calculation, but it's, it's possible, right? The important one is this one. So we need this uh, condition, and I'll get back to, to this for a moment. But actually, this plays a very important role for diffusions, for Langevin diffusion, right? So these assumptions, they are satisfied just to give you a, an idea for this type, by this type of potential, okay? So provided that beta is larger than one, so somehow in the terms you behave like an exponential, um, if you like, then basically you satisfy these uh, properties. So about this property here, it turns out that it is equivalent to a Poincaré inequality. And if you don't know what a Poincaré inequality, well, it says this, but really what is re very uh, important is that although it is far less intuitive than this one, because we can sort of figure out, you know, if you do the calculation, you can figure out why this is going to work or why this is not going to, um, to work. It is far less intuitive, at least to me, but what is interesting is that there is a vast literature, okay, on the, on the topic, and in particular, there are quantitative estimates of this in various um, scenarios, and I won't dwell too much on, on this, but that's interesting. And somehow there is a there, there is a bridge between the CP, right, and this limit, right? You can go from one to, um, to, to the other, okay? So if you look at this paper, for example, okay? The way we are going to express our results, we are going to express them in terms of CP, but also we are going to use this constant C2, which you can get from, from this, 
Okay, so basically, although this and this are equivalent, we are going to use this and this, right? So somehow we use this assumption uh, twice. Uh -huh. I guess it means that I should uh, almost stop, right? So we are going to require this assumption. So we define some FKs, and the updates will depend on the FKs uh, in the way I described earlier. They shouldn't be too crazy because you can imagine because it's a sum, you could add very large terms to very negative, very positive terms to very negative terms. Okay, so this prevents you from uh, doing that. So the distribution of the velocity, so essentially it should be isotropic. Uh, one can be um, a bit more precise. You need a fourth order moment for the, the components, right? What is important is that this is satisfied for all the distributions that we are interested in, 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 um, in general. One thing, and here there is a crucial uh, assumption for the, the specialist. So this is the intensity for the, um, the, the update where uh, you sample from new, right? And this should be bounded uh, away uh, from, from zero for the general result that we've got. It can be relaxed in very specific uh, scenario and it can grow, but really doesn't seem to affect at least the estimates that we we get, okay? So the low bounds can be relaxed for the zigzag process. And basically, provided that you've got those assumptions, which in the light of what I explained earlier, cover all those algorithms, basically you get the hypocoercivity uh, directly. You get explicit, explicit uh, expression for C and uh, alpha in terms of all the constants uh, involved, right? So one thing that we looked at was how these quantities sell uh, C and alpha scale with the dimension, right? So we tried to mimic somehow what Diakonis did in, the, in the, their paper. Okay, and these are the main conclusions. So first the constant, um, no problem with the constant. Okay, so the, the, the constant stay bounded uh, away from infinity. We, we don't have any problem with, um, with that. Then if we get, we look at um, basically alpha minus one, that was simple to think. So basically you don't want alpha to go to zero too quickly. So we looked at the inverse and we looked at how it was growing. And basically that's the estimate we get. So that's the dimension. So that's the uh, variance of your Vs, of your velocity. M2 is the variance of the components of the velocity. So we get a negative term. And K is the number of days that you've got, right? So of course this term is not very nice for the, the zigzag, okay? But it, it comes from the, it's the triangle inequality. So it's probably not very, um, very tight. So for example, for BPS and the uh, randomized hybrid Monte Carlo uh, method, so depending on your choice of M2, that was a discussion I had with Eric earlier, basically you get a complexity in the least favorable case that is at most D3 to the half, right? Um, but if you keep M2 constant, you get uh, this kind of uh, complexity, okay? So we don't know whether it's tight or not, okay? So I'd like to talk to Kengo a bit more about this. So it looks bad for the multivariate Z, uh, zigzag algorithm because in this scenario, K is as a function of D is equal to D and you get basically this dependence. So either three or uh, D to the uh, three plus a half, right? However, if you go through the calculations a bit more carefully and take into account the particular structure of the uh, zigzag um, process, what you find is that the complexity of the zigzag algorithm is at most m2 to the power minus a half, provided that you've got the additional assumption that your um, Hessian is not too badly to behave as a, as a function of the, of the, of the dimension. Right? So of course, depending on your, uh, on your choice of M2, you know, you're either indifferent to dimension or it gets worse at, uh, at a rate that is in um, square root of D, basically, because that's the typical choice people are interested in. Okay, and for the zigzag, what we can show is that in fact, the intensity for the refreshment can be taken to be zero outside arbitrarily small um, sets. Okay, but we still need it to be non-zero at some very specific point of the, of the space. 
and that's it. So there was a bonus, but I don't have time uh, for that. If really you're interested, you can come and talk to me. Um, so that was about the, uh, the approach. Here is some uh, advertisement. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that we haven't looked at yeah. yet. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Is your, is, are these more general constructs? Would they also be considered in the composition of reversible transitions? Uh, no, no, no. Here, here, basically, one of the, the elements of your composition is very specific. It has very specific properties. So, I don't think so, but uh, I don't know the real answer to your, to your question. Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, this is the second question. Is it possible to apply lambda zero pro proportional to a square root of d? Is it possible? Uh, lambda zero proportional to square root of uh, d? Yes, you can. Uh, actually, you can. Yeah. Right. So does it change the rate? Of no, it doesn't change the rate. So basically, that, that's what is surprising with um, underlying lambda in a notation, is that basically it doesn't affect the rate. Okay, but you shouldn't take it too large as a function of d. Uh, otherwise, you get a penalty. Uh, at least, I mean, all these are bounds on things, okay? So we don't know if, whether they, they are tight. Uh, 